Brother Jerry, uh, so good to have you. Welcome to the Garrison Institute. Thank you so much for um, stepping into this invitation. I remember when I, I came across your work and I was like, why don't we just hold something at the Garrison? So how are you? I'm great. I'm a little too excited about this call, so I'm likely to talk fast. And one of the things I really appreciate about the way you hold space is that you slow things down very nicely in a way that lets people be present and lets us not rush over things. So I have a bunch of ideas on this topic and I'm likely to speed up a bit too much, but I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, no, thank you. I'll try my best to, to slow us down. Uh, yeah, well, I, might get, I might get too excited as well and 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 then rush so let's dive in brother um let's let's have a little dialogue between you and i and then we'll involve everyone else um so what what do you tell us a little bit about this framework this thinking this this notion of design from trust how did you come to it why is it important to you yeah it's funny um there's a whole bunch of different th different things that kind of clicked in place uh one of them was long time ago um, I read an, uh, Doc Searles, a friend of mine, sent me an essay by uh, John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O, who's a retired New York high school teacher. And the essay was called The Six Lesson School Teacher. And he said, look, nominally, I'm your, your kid's high school English teacher, but let me tell you what I was really teaching your kid. <clears throat> and I'm teaching them to be obedient. I'm teaching them that I'm God in the classroom. What I say goes. I can leave a mark on their record that it will be really hard to get, you know, to scrub off. I'm teaching them to control their attention and to drop everything when I tell them to and move on to the next class. A whole, a whole series of things that are now kind of known as the hidden curriculum of schooling. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. We designed an institution to try to teach humans to be good citizens, I would think. And we did it in a way that kind of broke our assumption that they were acting in good faith, that they might be curious, that whatever. And then I, I, sort, of, I sort of started peeling into that long ago. Um, and I don't think I realized all the connections at, any, at all. And then scroll by 10 years and I realized that I have heroes, I have role models, I call my contrarians because most of them are heretics in their own fields. And that each of my heretics is saying roughly the same thing about their own field, right? So Alice Miller is a Swiss psychotherapist who, who talked about the repetition compulsion. She was a, one of the originators of family systems thinking uh, and unresolved childhood trauma is one of her things. But she's basically saying, we don't trust kids to report back what happened to them among other things that she's saying we don't trust. I'm like, bingo, yes. Um, Christopher Alexander, a cranky urban planner and architect uh, with some of his colleagues back in the early 80s invents something called pattern languages, which are ways of distilling the wisdom of their field, urban planning and architecture into a language that ordinary mortals, muggles like us could absorb and then start using, right? So a pattern language helps equip you to have a better, more intelligent, to participate at a much higher level with people who are trying to build your city, your house, whatever. And what he's saying is, if you trust humans, ordinary people, and equip them a little bit, you can suddenly turn them from being mere consumers at the end of it into something else. And then last note here is that I, I realized I hated the word consumer back in the mid nineties. And all of this sort of came together. And I realized that when we treat us as consumers instead of as humans or citizens, we are really lessening us. We are really um, screwing up the native genius and intelligence that we have. Mm. Oh, thank you for that. Let's go a little deeper in terms of uh, mistrust. And I know that a lot of your work is, is, is inspired by rethinking this notion of consumer. And it, it just feels as though um, what will move me about your work is just how much in this moment, especially in the US, but also globally, there's been a breach of trust. Um, on the one hand, on, on the consumer level when it comes to technology and the ways in which we're tracked and uh, online and all of a sudden I have these pants that I actually wanted, but I, I, how, did the, how did this thing know that I wanted these pants? But so, this, so I just want to touch on that in terms of the relationship between mistrust, trust and then consumerism. So some more thoughts on that. And then also, knowing that right now we are facing so many different crises um, that are generating levels of mistrust. And so your thoughts on that as we begin to land design from trust? Damn, those are huge questions. Thank you. Take your time. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. You, uh, there was an old Peanuts cartoon that um, Lucy goes in and picks up her test and it says, uh, explain World War II. And then under that, use both sides of the page if necessary. <laughs> I, I always remember that that little cartoon from, from ages ago. Um, so have you heard the term the stalker economy? Mm -hmm. No. So there's a there's stalker economy, there's surveillance capitalism, which yeah. is a, a book that Shoshana Zuboff recently wrote that's gotten some attention. There's a few terms here of things that we have completely normalized. Like we have somehow taken for granted that advertising and the way the, the, me, the mechanisms of the advertising business are necessary and the only way to, to, for companies to sell things and so forth. And if you, if you sort of pop the hood on advertising, first they're stalking us and dumpster diving and, and buying and selling and matching our data in the background so that they can remix it to put that ad that's stalking you across from website to website, which is its own little marketplace, that horizontal cookie tracking thing. There's a, there's a whole series of companies that do nothing but that, mm -hmm. right? And there's this whole sub-industry to stalking us and, and collecting up our information. And very few people are aware of how much information is actually collected and what that does. But, but the part that's remarkable to me is we're just assuming that that's okay and that that's the way it has to be. And, and Doc Searles, the same guy that sent me that essay long ago, he's now in, in, uh, at the head of something called Vendor Relationship Management or VRM, and also the Customer Commons, where he's trying to reverse this, trying to make it so that we can say, I'm looking to buy a stroller, who would like to make me a good offer? And, mm -hmm. and I think it's a really hard road to hoe to try to reverse the mechanisms of commerce, right? To try to flip around the power structures. Mm -hmm. But all of that showed up for me. And then part of my realization when I started seeing these hidden architectures of mistrust is what I call them. So all the things that create scarcity where there's abundance in school, for example, are the hidden architectures of mistrust um, is that we had designed every one of our institutions for mistrust. Mm. Um, and, and, and my own sort of view on this was kind of from a wonky corner of institutional design and how do you design social systems and all that. And when you invited me into this conversation, I suddenly sat with the question of what does this mean for racism and mistrust across all sorts of other divides? And I, I, I had to sit down. I was just like shaken because, because there's so many different kinds of bias and, and other sorts of mistrust baked into our systems. And my own intuition on all this is if we can flip that around, if we can make it so that people can connect with each other better from a, a, a basis of trust, even if they disagree a lot, and then maybe redesign the systems in which they live, or at least question those assumptions, we could solve a lot of the downstream problems that now we try to solve with policing, with social programs, with whatever, whatever, whatever. We're busy trying to patch stuff that's broken way upstream because we lost faith in humans somewhere long ago. And we bought a narrative that most people are not trustworthy. Mm. Mm. So it was okay to design all of our institutions with that assumption in mind. And when you do that, you weaken everybody's sense of agency and participation and responsibility. You then automate the whole system in ways that are actually usually not very functional. And when the system starts to fail, you turn the knob to 11 to try to fix it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I want us and the entire the audience to feel into this moment where we're trying to ground design from trust and, and almost touch um, so much that's connected to it um, in terms of this particular moment. You know, I'm thinking about the still very polarized moment that the US is going through uh, politically. I'm also thinking about in a larger level, the, the, the breach of trust in terms of our relationship to Mother Earth and the ecological challenges that are before us. The more and more I think about it, this framework of design from trust is, is, is incredibly important. Um, I've, um, I've seen, you know, we're, we're pivoting now towards next week and next week is significant in the US symbolically because of the collective trauma that unfolded as a byproduct of the death of George Floyd. And so thinking about trust and the breach of trust and the tensions between police and communities and the last year uh, feels like there's been a reckoning in, in the country. Um, and then what I wanna kind of invite you to kind of reflect on 
is primarily what what how does how do you think uh, design from trust as a methodology could enable communities to uh, create maybe social structures that would enable um, generative relationships? Uh, love that. So um, the Wikipedia is one of my favorite examples of how to explain design from trust because almost everybody's touched it by now. And most people have had that moment where like the light bulb went off and they realized how the Wikipedia works, which is that any idiot on earth can change any page on the Wikipedia and hit save and it'll be changed. The saving factor is that there's lots of people keeping eyes on the changes and when something is wrong, they just hit revert. And it's easier to fix a problem than it is to go vandalize the Wikipedia. And weirdly, it turns out that on the whole, that seems to work. But the Wikipedia didn't start as the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia start, started when Jimmy Wales hired uh, Larry Sanger and they started the Newpedia project because Jimmy had made some money trading commodities in Chicago and wanted to create a free encyclopedia for the world. So they contracted with 80 experts, divided up all the topics, English, mathematics, geography. And after a couple of years, they had like 20 finished entries because they had a seven layer editorial process. Hmm. And in the middle, somebody explained to them what a wiki was and wikis are designed from trust because wikis allow, it's, it's a communal website building process. And so Jimmy went to his experts and he said, um, so don't worry about it. Your jobs are still good, but I, I put this Wikipedia thing over there. We're gonna go experiment with it. And then the rest is history. There's this hockey stick, it just takes off. I, and I tell that story because when you start with an assumption of good intent and you try to actively design from trust, you build a different system. It's not, it's not that you both the design thinking on the old system and you improved. It's like my critique of design thinking is if I asked you to design a better bell in the schoolroom, you might change it and make Beethoven's Ninth Symphony play every hour on the hour. But the problem is that there's a bell ringing every hour telling you to drop everything, stop your focus and move on. Mm. And so trying to fix the local little thing I think is sort of a fruitless effort. It can pay off. There's good things that can come out of it. And I like design thinking, but it has no moral compass. Mm. It's not trying to figure out what's broken with the systems around you. And then how do we address that in some way? And sometimes you have to hack the systems around you. Sometimes you have to use some of the bad aspects. You know, there's people using corporate personhood to win rights for nature and for great apes and for rivers to mm. be represented in legislative process. That's awesome. And I hate corporate personhood. Mm. So. So, so the design process here has to be really creative. And one of the best ways to do design from trust is to absorb stories of it from mm. all disciplines from all around the world. And then to say that looks like something we might be able to use. And then as you reach out to try to appropriate it and apply it to your own setting, can we help you do that? Do, mm -hmm. we, have ex do we have experts who could, who could help you do it, who are coming in going not, we did a study and these are the best practices, just do this, but instead, how do I help you? What's your situation? How do we make this actually work for you on the ground? And yeah. if we did that, if we like blather, rinse, repeat on that, I think a lot of really good things come out. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to highlight the connection to design thinking because design from trust is in the lineage of all the design methodologies, design thinking, human-centered design. And that point you said around the ethical compass, I think it's a major. I want to kind of bring the audience in um, because as you said there, you know, it takes a village, you know, and it's, it's important. So help me, help me here. Help me, help me engage uh, Jerry, uh, folks. Um, any questions around design from trust? We'll, we'll do a short contemplative practice later, and then we'll, we'll break out into small breakout groups to discuss what is, tr how do you define trust and how you build trust, right? So that we can help Jerry and this conception of design from trust become more robust, right? So we're gonna together theorize. Yes, Ken. Hello, everybody. Um, Jerry, I have a question. Uh, it seems to me that in, in the big five, the psychological big five, we have openness to experience. And um, I, I suspect that there's a certain thrownness to some people who come into the world and they don't trust the world is a safe place. And so for them, Design for mistrust is the natural way to do that. They need to make themselves feel safe. And other people come into the world with a great deal of openness to new experience. And we trust that people are good. We trust we're going to be safe. And so design from trust makes a great deal of sense to them. 
how do we reconcile design from trust with people whose natural way of being is one of mistrusting? Um, thanks, Ken. One of my favorite human beings just asked that question. So that's really nice. Um, th it's perfectly legitimate to believe that people are born evil or that people are born good. And some people are somewhere in the middle, but that's a well-known philosophical sort of dichotomy. And I happen to land on the people are born good and I think babies are connected to the universe. And then we socialize that out of them. And th this showed up for me long ago when I learned that there's a phase that babies go through called echolalic babbling, where they make the sounds of every language on earth. Mm -hmm. Then we teach them our language. And then when we put them in language school at age 13, their palate muscles and throat muscles have all salt firmed up and they can't make those funny new rolling R's and, and accents and whatever else. But when they're babies, they kind of go through doing all of that. And, and babies are born with their neurons overconnected and the ones that don't get used wither away from us. So we're born like full, for me, fully connected. And it's totally legit to have the opposite point of view. And if you go look at a, a domain I'm not that fond of like game theory, it turns out that when you play a tit for tat game, that the, an opening offer of, of goodness, a, a good play usually wins tit for tat, like that works out well. But that's like a really kind of mad scientific way of looking at it that I don't really like. Um, and for me, for me, the question you ask goes straight into trauma um, because anybody who's lived through trauma, whether they remember it or not, um, is very justified in thinking the world is a dangerous place and that things are not gonna work out well and that they better just sort of roll up into their cocoon or their shell and stop sort of participating or trusting or something like that. And some people who've been through a lot of trauma magically make their way through that and are really open and accepting of the big five, the openness to change to, to others' opinions and stuff like that. And I think that's a, it's an act of faith and an act of courage in them that I really admire. And I, I think a big piece of design from trust is actually addressing the trauma and finding our way through it together. And I'll add a sort of a sad grace note, which is that we're in the middle of this political moment that we just brought into the conversation where trust has been weaponized and mistrust has been pumped on purpose because there's a time honored tradition in politics that if you do that, you can win elections. So we have to find our way to actually trusting other humans um, at a time when lots of people have suffered lots of trauma, including the kinds of mass societal trauma, like a lockdown and pandemic, like uh, the deprecate, like, like the caste system, which lives around the world, like all sorts of things we sort of, that come up into the spotlight and then sort of fade back into the, the, the background noise of what civilization appears to be. Uh, we have to make our way through some of these things together. Um, and I'm weirdly optimistic that the solution to weaponized mistrust is actually sort of going after this way of dealing with trauma and, and, and walking back into trust. And that's why I wrote, a, I gave a talk and wrote a post called Trust is the Only Way Forward, because I actually think that space travel, great. So we've broken this little rock, the planet we're on, we've broken this one, we might as well populate other planets before we wipe ourselves out. A, pretty cynical. B, you don't want to be on the first thousand spaceships off this rock if we haven't solved trust. Like mm -hmm. you do not want to be on those spacecraft because anything breaks, you're all hosed. Uh, anyway, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I, I went far afield from the topic, but it's really rich. Thank you. So I met Fukuyama once long ago because he gave a lunch talk at PC Forum, uh, probably 1995 or something like that. And he had just, I think, published trust. And I, I tried to start reading it. And I will confess that I bonked at the point where he was making generalized statements about high trust and low trust societies in ways that just weren't mapping to my head. But I agree with everything else you just said about how central trust is to business, to life, to society. Like it, it's crucial. It's like it underpins so many things. And it shows up in the room the minute you get more than one human in a room. Like, like th there's, you know, trust is an important topic really fast when you're doing something very minor and certainly when you're doing really important things. Um, and then Fukuyama also wrote uh, The End of History and the Last Man, which has kind of been debunked. Uh, bad idea. He was like, oh, this neoliberal sort of uh, agenda that we're in right now is we don't need to, we don't need to perfect democracy and capitalism anymore. It, it, this is the one. And he was like really wrong on that. So, so he's sort of up and down in my, in my list of philosophers I love, um, kind, of, kind of lower on the list. But the idea of what countries to follow is super interesting because I have a list in in my brain, in a, in a mind map that I've been feeding for 23 years, um, I have a, a, a list of um, examples of design from trust. 
and uh, it's world, it's it's international, and it includes things like in Scandinavia back in the 30s, 40s, I think, maybe earlier, they had a system of schools called folk schools or folkskolen, um, which a fifth or a third of the population went to and went through and which taught them citizenship and response, mutual responsibility and respect for, and, and possibly one of the reasons why Northern European social democracies are among the happiest government systems on earth is, is, is owed to that, that a whole bunch of the population actually went to a different kind of school that, that, that focused on that. And that might be one sort of thing. But then if you go around the world, you can find design from trust in participatory budgeting in Brazil and in different kinds of open, open process in, in Montreal and Vancouver. And th th there's example after example everywhere. And then there are a few countries like Estonia, which won its independence back from you know, the Soviet bloc. And then uh, they were like, well, we kind of got nothing. Let's go electronic. So they made everything paperless and openly available. Like you can go look at all the records and all the documents. And, and so how Estonia then developed a digital version of administration and democracy is a really nice model for maybe how to move forward. And you could go to Norway and look at what they've done to jails. They're, they're closing down almost their, all their jails because they have a completely different idea about what to do about crime and criminals. Um, so there's examples, I think, beautiful examples of design from trust everywhere across the earth. Things broke, we lost faith in humans, and then we handed the world over to white men to design all of our institutions. And we excluded everybody else from the design positions and from the positions of power. And, and you know, it, it's sort of like the white hegemony ran the table and managed to design everything to exclude everybody pretty much systematically and is busy trying to keep that going now. Look at all the voter suppression acts that are being passed in states in the US as a result of the mess of, of the election, which was a great and solid election, but hey. Um, so I think there's, there's a whole lot of that. Um, I, I'm, here's an unorthodox answer to your question, which is um, I have a, a possibly outlier belief that it was, it's not that we were like sort of dumb before and we've gotten smarter over time and civilization has gotten better and better. But I believe that 40,000 years ago, we were really smart. And those of us who had survived all around the world had hard won wisdom, which we passed down through ritual and storytelling and song lines and everything else. And most of us at that point understood how to live on the land as landscape and take care of the landscape instead of divide, dividing it up into little individual plots and having ownership. And we understood how to live together on this land. And there were, there were conflicts, but mostly we kind of sorted a lot of that out. And you can find a lot of that if you go back into indigenous practices and, and sort of peek under the, under the hood there. And it's like, oh, wow, this is like a great way to set up a society and live. Then we destroyed that. We went systematically around the earth in the colonial era, which is why decolonizing is such a nightmarishly complicated thing to do. And we systematically went about trying to stamp out all those things, calling them heresies and saying, nope, 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 you have to believe this other set of things, which were actually dysfunctional. And so we're trying to hit undo on that stack of, of things, right? Which are instantiated in the other institutions, like do you have a social democracy or a, or a par parliamentary do democracy or a monarchy or this, they're instantiated in all, all those different kinds of systems. And the good news is that now information travels at zero cost at the speed of light and people are sharing great ideas and there's bubbling pots of really beautiful sets of ideas of how to fix this all over the world. And part of what my Open Global Mind group is trying to do is, can we get our arms around them? Can we make them more accessible? Can we explain them better so that more people go, I'll have what they're having? And how do we sort of propagate that more widely? So sorry for the wide sort of coursing answer, but I think your question's right on. Work from home has really been dramatic in the sense of like, how do we trust employees? And some employers have gone so far as key logging and other sorts of things to make and, and, and tracking whether somebody's face was present in their Zoom frame or whatever they were using uh, and all, just to guarantee that they were doing the work, right? Um, and there's a whole bunch of things like workplace democracy and other things that are movements to try to figure out about how do you trust your employees? And my favorite example of trusting your employees is a guy named Ricardo Semler from Brazil. Uh, who inherited his dad's company called Semco. Uh, his dad was a type A, type X, normal sort of manager who had built this sort of business to business, we solve thorny problems business. And then, uh, and Semler just wanted to um, surf and play in his rock band until his dad got sick and died young. And so Semler comes in and changes everything slowly over time uh, to the point where all their books were open, employees set their salaries and bonuses, but they also had open books, which meant 
they knew that if they drained the company of whatever they needed to invest in the company next quarter, that would all be gone, right? And they would kill the company. So, so there were lots of layers of trust, but it, it, he talks in one, of, in one of his books, he talks about a moment where he's negotiating with two union representatives, one of whom is Ignacio Lula da Silva, who later becomes the president of Brazil, later goes to jail, and now might become the president of Brazil again. Anyway, Lula and the other union rep are sure that Semler just wants to take away the five minute grace period that the workers have when they clock in to when they get to be at their station. They're sure he's trying to negotiate that away. When in fact, what he says is, why don't we take away the timekeeping system? I just wanna know the work got done. You sort out how it gets done. Let's take away the punch in punch out time clocks. And it took them six months to wrap their heads around that. Then they moved forward with that. And that was like a tipping block that, that released a bunch of other things for that little enterprise, right? But I, for me, the more we hear stories like this from, from success stories, from other enterprises, from other places in the world, the more we might be motivated to do this. And I think there's a, you know, there, there's a, a CEO of a company that published something really stupid sort of to their employees recently about the, the transition now back to working in the office. And they got hammered in the public, just hammered. And that's interesting. I don't like people being hammered. I'd rather we actually open that up and unpack it into a thoughtful conversation that lets us all make better decisions. The, the, the public vendetta, vindictiveness that's out, that's out there right now, I do not like at all. Um, for me, when somebody does something wrong, and, and you brought up bad actors as well, which is this, its own huge, huge topic, um, the best thing to do is to mainstream them back in, solving or correcting for whatever got them to do the wrong acts. The worst thing is keep cutting people out of the herd so that finally there's like three of you in the room because everybody did something wrong. You know, we don't want society like that. And one of my problems with the systems that are designed for mistrust is that they're designed around the bad actors first. We try to eliminate the bad actors from doing bad things in the institution's design instead of dealing with the bad actors last and very creatively. How, what can we, like, if you in the early days of Wikipedia, if you did something bad to Wikipedia, um, you might get an, a personal note from another Wikipedia and saying, hey, what's up? Usually we do this. This is how we usually do this instead of what you did. And it's an invitation to come in and be a curator of this thing instead of vandalizing. And very often what people really want is to be heard. We're in a crisis of not listening to each other. And so sometimes what people really want is to be heard with respect and to be treated with dignity. And that little set of gestures opens up tremendous doors. So sorry, every, every question has, has, has opened like these little advent calendar kind of windows where I'm like, that is a huge and wonderful topic. So thank you for the, the really generative conversation. I want, to, I, want to give, I want to give everybody an opportunity to, to reflect for a moment. And I think that, that we're heading is pretty positive. I'm weirdly optimistic, despite the very strange moment that we're in worldwide. I'm weirdly optimistic because I see that we're beginning to figure out how to ask these questions and have these conversations. I, I remember a long time ago <clears throat> opening the New York Times Magazine and they had an article about, about kids born with mul of multiple families of multiple origins. And the, the top across like a six page spread article, the top was I think two deep thumbnail photos of kids and under each kid, um, it had you know, like Cuban, Nigerian, uh, Swedish, Japanese, uh, whatever, what, what, like the, the, the birth origins of each child. It was the most beautiful thing. I've been looking for it since because I'd like to like, like be able to absorb it. It was just this thing of enormous human beauty. I'm like, why can't we see that as beauty? But then back to your question, Cecilia, I'm really interested in people's family of origin stories and like, like the hardships they went through, which my family never told me. Like, one of, the, one of the few bad things both my mother's and father's sides of the family did was keep from me the hardships that they had had in getting to where they were. My mom was born in Berlin in 1934. They escaped in 39. I didn't know that. Mm. A bunch of other stuff sort of came out. Um, and it's like, how do we appropriately have these conversations so that they don't trigger and they're very respectful, but we understand better. And this takes vulnerability on the part of people who may not want to be vulnerable and may have no good reason to make themselves vulnerable and who've always been asked to make themselves vulnerable in situations like that. So it's unfair, right? But, but I think learning how to have those conversations is really crucial here. Uh, there he is. As folks trickle back in, um, 
what, what's, what's still present for you in regards to those robust reflections and comments? Um, I love the depth of the conversation here. I love, I'm learning a lot just listening to and reading comments and replying to the comments um, <clears throat> and realizing sort of how broad and deep the topic is. I mean, it's funny, trust is one of those words, it's like democracy or capitalism or whatever that we think we understand until we start talking about it. Mm -hmm. And then we realize that it's like, it's like an onion inside of a shallot surrounded by a turkey and a duck or something. <clears throat> it's like a turd onion. Well, that doesn't sound good. Do not eat the turd onion. It sounds really <laughs> deadly. Uh, it gives you gas and it tastes bad. Um, but, but also how important these issues are and how central they are to a lot of our efforts. Like, like you know, whatever project each of you is on, whatever quest each of you is on, if trust were ratcheted up 40% all of a sudden, could you get your task done better? Very likely, yes. Um, if, we could, if we could sort of melt the distrust that's been fomented out in the world, could we solve some problems together as humans? Probably yes. <clears throat> and, then, and then maybe also, I'm asking lots of questions all the time about, okay, so what does a <clears throat> trust first attitude look like in the world? How do you, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not promoting naive trust, uh, and, and the whole question of bad actors, I have a, I, I do this often in speeches, I have a section where I say, you know, everybody knows there's bad actors. And I show a photo of Michael Hasselhoff <clears throat> from, from Knight Rider back in the day, who is a bad actor. And it usually gets a chuckle in the room. Um, but how we deal with bad actors is hugely important. And we have it ass backwards right now. Right now we're cutting people out of the herd and salting the ground they stood on and making sure they never have a job and social media vigilantism and all of that. Hmm, it would be interesting to have like a truth and reconciliation process for people who did something bad and figure out how to, how to solve properly um, what happened. Um, I'm a fan of restorative justice, uh, but I ran into a woman who's invented something, I'm forgetting what she calls it, but it's sort of, it's sort of bigger than restorative justice and I'll, I'll find it, it's integrative justice, I think. And her process looks up at the system because restorative justice versus retributive justice is a great thing. It's like, let's not just try to take a pound of flesh, let's fix the situation here on the ground. Her approach was, let's look up into the system and see if we can't affect the system forces that cause this thing to happen, whether that's poverty or over-policing or, or, or who knows what else uh, was happening, which I really love. Um, and, and all too often I find myself scratching at system-wide issues that feel too big to handle uh, or too big to change. And yet I've seen really interesting changes in my lifetime of, of points of view, of attitudes. I mean, I'm old enough to have witnessed the Reagan revolution and to watch how government went from being a sometimes helpful entity to being the enemy. And like, you know, the nine scariest words anybody's ever said is I'm from the government and I'm here to help to quote Reagan directly. And, and completely undermining the idea that, that us sharing what we made in order to maintain this commons together is a good thing. It's something we have to dig our way out of right now. That's amazing to me. Yeah. So, so all those things are kind of swirling around in my head. And, but in particular, I'm interested in how to implement this stuff. How do we, how to turn design from trust into a practice, into a, into a dojo, uh, into a, a community, into other sorts of things. And um, I'd love to know more about that from, from what anybody thinks. So I posted a bunch of videos on YouTube about Trump and how to deal with Trump and the Trumpocalypse. And one of the things I say is that people trust Donald Trump um, for a variety of different reasons. And one of them is, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of the jobs to be done framework. It's like you, you sort of hire a cup of coffee and that its job is to keep you awake or to give you something to fumble with or to whatever, right? And the job to be done that a bunch of people I think voted for Trump for was to shatter the government, to actually try to destroy it. And if he got wealthy and fat and happy while doing that, that was perfectly okay with them because they didn't see a future for them. And, and part, you know, part of the conversation this, I had this morning was the most dangerous people on earth are those who see no prospects for themselves or their children, who see that, that the future just looks really, really bleak. Those people are extremely dangerous. And if we can help them by actually helping them build a future and building it with them and for them instead of to them or on them, so much the better. Um, but there's a bunch of people, one of the things I say when I explain trust is like, you can trust Dr. Evil, right? He's evil but you know that he's always gonna to try to kill Austin Powers 
and you know that he's not quite capable of doing so, so he's going to fail. But there's a deep sense of trust with Dr. Evil. You also kind of know that he's going to be really funny because Mike Myers is inherently funny, um, except for that guru movie. But, um, but Trump is kind of weirdly the same way. And the people on the far right have built a sense of community among themselves that they weren't getting anywhere else. So you're on Reddit or 8chan or whatever, and you come up with tomorrow's Pepe the Frog gift that's going to be propagated through the right wing uh, echo chamber and you kind of win that day you're doing high fives with people you've met you've, you have a sense of community that turns into a bunch of people showing up on the steps of the capitol january 6th and i think to think of that of those people as not wanting community and not trusting anything or anyone or whatever i think that's a mistake and and i'm trying to creep inside their heads a little bit to figure out how are they thinking? Why are they motivated to do this? Why did they think that that bet was worth more than other bets put in front of them uh, that were about how to fix society and what to do? And by the way, at the side, I have a similar critique about the systems that we're living inside of that are broken. Like I, so there was a really nice flow chart at the beginning of the 2020 election that had, uh, you know, is shit broken? And on the, on the right was yes. And the two candidates that said thing were, things were broken were Trump and Bernie. And then everybody else was like, stuff's okay, just let us fix it with current systems. And then Bernie didn't get the nomination. And then we got Trump partly because I think of some of this logic. Um, so sorry for the long dive into politics and all that. And I didn't even mention that this morning's conversation was a lot about the Israeli-Palestinian dilemma, which is hot right now and has you know, uh, roots that are, that are a fire uh, and a flame. But I think that all of this is really important for us to actually deal with. And so, so I think that people do trust Trump in that way. And he's, he's, he's eminently predictable and predictability uh, you know, is one of the attributes of trust. There are many others. There's like affective trust is about, do I like you? And do I think you have my interest, my interest at hand? He is none of that. But do I think you will do the thing you promised to do? You betcha. This means applause. Yes. And I've, I've been teaching this through the, through the lockdown because in Zoom, when a lot of people are doing this, this means I disagree with what's being said. This means I agree. This means I'm eh, not so sure. Um, and, and, I, and if you do this everywhere in all these, in our little rectangles in Zoom, it's really a nice temperature read of what's being said, and it doesn't interrupt. And a lot of people are trained to, to snap in school. The snapping isn't as visual and you don't wanna hear anything. It's, you know, so it's, it's non-interruptive. Thank you for the explanation. Thanks, you'll see me doing this a lot. And it's not because I have like a reflex problem. Um. We want to definitely have a so Shayla, we'll circle back to you. Uh, let's just have Jerry share his brain. You'll see cool. he has something cool to share. Sounds great. And and Ken reminded me that that we've been talking a lot about listening and respect and all that. And there's a hero of mine, one of my role models, is a, a black musician named Daryl Davis. And some of you may have watched this TED talk or whatever else. Uh, Daryl has a, a garage full of KKK robes. Because many, many years ago, he was in a bar playing sort of honky tonk uh, piano and a white guy came up, came up to him and said, hey, I never heard uh, anybody play Jerry Lee Lewis like that. Uh, and he, they started a conversation and it turns out that the guy he sort of slightly became friends with was a KKK wizard. And over time, over more than a year, in, they invited themselves to each other's houses. And then over like three or four years, the guy retired out and gave him his robe and then Daryl sort of, by that time, Daryl was attending KKK rallies and listening with respect. And, and there's, a, there's a, a beautiful thing you can see on YouTube because YouTube is the vast container of everything that's ever happened, apparently. It's, it's Borges' Aleph actually exists. It's called YouTube. Um, and you can go there and you can see that, that this guy in KKK robe saying, this guy right here, he re I, I respect him because he respects me. Super, super interesting. So uh, with that, and with maybe a brief pause, uh, let me shift over to sharing my brain. Um, and Eric Erickson just came up in conversation, so I went and looked him up immediately. He's a developmental psychologist who attended the Macy conferences. What were the Macy conferences? They happened 41 to 1960, uh, hosted by the Josiah Macy, Macy Foundation. And they had a bunch of really bright thinkers of the day, Gregory Bateson, Kurt Lewin, uh, unfortunately way too many men. Margaret Mead was one of the few women uh, invited to the conference, but a lot of interesting things came out of this meeting of the minds. Um, 
Every node here is called a thought because this software is called the brain. I did not create this software. I was on their first press tour 23 and a half years ago. And the moment the inventor opened his laptop and showed me this with whatever he had in his laptop, I was like, oh, my brain kind of works like this. And uh, so here's, uh, well, let's go back to Eric Erickson just so that we can stare at what he did as far as I've been able to understand it. So here's Erickson's stages of life. Uh, he came up with the idea of the identity crisis. Uh, his wife was Joan Erickson, and I don't remember what else is here. I'm, I'm sort of inferring just from looking at this because I haven't looked at um, this, this node, this thought for a while. But the, the brain lets me connect things to each other with these three little circles called gates. So all of these lines you see connecting thoughts, I put in by hand. The brain, despite being called the brain, has no intelligence in it. It's like Photoshop for ideas. But this very minimalist ability to link things up down and left, notice there's no little gate on the right, has this incredibly strong expressive capacity for me. So I've been using this for a long time. So for example, I was on the forum uh, when Dr. Michael Eric Dyson was uh, Angel's guest and I kept notes in my brain. So this little red link looks like a YouTube link because later uh, you posted the video to YouTube. So I just put the link on here. And if I click, if I were to click right now on this little link, it would send me to the video on YouTube of that whole event. But in the event, we talked a lot about hip hop. Uh, we also talked about the book Meditations of the Heart, uh, which is, uh, was written by Howard Thurman, uh, who also wrote Jesus and the Disinherited, which was carried by Martin Luther King. and was one of his big inspirations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so you can, see, um, you can see kind of how I use this thing. And uh, in the middle of it all, I've got principles of design from trust. So here's, uh, basically a starting point. Uh, I have a whole bunch of things around design from trust, as you can see here, but maybe a nice starting point is something like principles of design from trust, which I will go back to. And then I'll, I'll give everybody in the chat a link directly to this thought. So I can, I can, let me stop sharing and post in the chat, a link to that thought. This won't work on a phone. Uh, it's ugly on a phone, but if you're on your laptop or iPad or whatever, if you tap on that link, it should take you into my brain, which might take a minute to actually ping the server and get information back, but you should be able to see what I was just showing you and then navigate it by yourself anywhere you want at any time you want. Um, so, so I've been curating this mind map uh, for 23 years and other people using the brain create new brain files all the time. The file I'm showing you right now and sharing with you is the same file that I started 23 and a half years ago. I've only ever created one data file with this software. So in my so Joachim is in this mind map. Uh, Angel's been in it for a while now. Ken Homer, you can learn a lot about him. Uh, uh, you, you know, I kept out of it the time he and I spent together at Sing Sing, but that's okay. That doesn't need to see the light of day. Um, but, but, the, but it's interesting for me what you learn over time when you curate what you care about and what, what's worth seeing. And when you turn that into sort of editorial or opinions or, or insights or for and against. So this whole idea is, are people born good or bad? Trust me, that's in my brain, for example. And what I'm trying to do is build up a way of connecting that to why I think design from trust is the way to go, for example. Um, I, Joachim, I have 460,000 nodes uh, connected by more than 860,000 links, all put in by me by hand over 23 years. If you do the math, it's about 50 a day. Wow. <laughs> so I'm happy to do more of a tour of it and do some more screen sharing, but it's a little overwhelming. Um, so I will pause and see where the interest is. And, and by the way, I've got cocktail recipes in there and racism in America. And my wife and I recently watched the documentary, The Black Church, which was phenomenal and taught me about a bunch of people I'd never heard of. So I put that in uh, and I'm trying to figure out how to tell these stories using this weird medium as a storytelling mechanism. So I can, I've also got a bunch of videos on YouTube where I use the brain and I screen share and all you hear is my voice while I'm clicking through the brain telling stories. It's really interesting because I'm a believer in a lot of contrarian ideas. I'm in my brain, one of my favorite sections is contrarians who make or made sense. And in there I have Alice Miller and John Taylor Gatto and a bunch of the sort of my heroes, all of whom were considered heretics in their field and contrarians. And they were, in many cases, they got old and bitter because they'd been kicked around and kicked out by their contemporaries and then sort of disregarded and dismissed because what they were saying didn't fit 
institutions of the time. Um, and so what's the difference between a contrarian and a kook? And somebody who's got like a crazy idea that if we followed it uh, would take us like, you know, would break civilization or something like that. And how do you treat somebody who has a kooky idea with respect to figure out where did that come from and how does that work? It's, it's sort of the, like, like trust the people you can't trust kind of thing. How do you still enter that conversation and figure out um, where it goes, how to, how to tip that person back toward rationality or whether you need to loosen up some of your beliefs because what they're saying is just too hard for you to understand. And you need to hold it in some little back drawer for a while. Um, Ex-Mormons have a saying that broke my shelf, which is they go through life and they run into instances where something's happening and it rubs completely wrong with uh, Mormon victims. It, it just goes against what they've been trained to believe. And they put that issue on the shelf. And that happens often enough that one of these things finally breaks their shelf and they talk about, then they have a crisis of identity and a religious crisis and often they leave, they become ex-Mormons. So, so we're inside of neoliberal economic free marketarian global, globalized whatnot that's caused a bunch of ruckus in the world that people are protesting against. And, and large international treaties made it so that people don't have the rights to fight back in many cases and are being squeezed even further. All of this has to do with trust and with institutional design. And so the question is, how do we, how do we come back into these conversations when the people in power realize that by undermining these conversations, they can in fact continue to be in power and continue to support these, these institutions. So mm -hmm. I, I, love the, I love your emphasis on trusting the people you can't trust. That's yeah. great. A really nice insight jerry jerry so this is one of the first really uh public uh comprehensive uh, moments where a desire from trust is getting you know so many eyes and, and hearts on it how do you feel what's 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 uh yeah what's any 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 places where you feel like you're at the edge um so my perennial dilemma is how to turn this into more of a thing in the world. And by which I don't mean, how do I trademark it and own it? How do I uh, foist it on everybody? But by which I mean, how do I uh, make it easier for people to take this point of view and implement it in whatever ways that means in their lives, right? And so, uh, so I'm actually um, hoping to host a conversation uh, in a month uh, around people who have been approaching me because they heard me say something about design from trust a decade ago and, or, or more recently. And they're like, there's something there. How do we turn it in, into something? So I think a, a lot of what I could use is advice on how to manifest this, this thing in the world to make it really useful and how to improve it, how to, you know, tweaks to the design or the thinking in it where, where it's broken because, um, um, because I, I know it's not a it's not a perfect theory. I just think it's a really powerful notion, uh, a way of looking at and critiquing institutions that we take for granted and and biases that are right in front of us, but we've normalized so we don't pay attention to them. I mean, yeah. and, and this is just so pervasive. It's just everywhere. Yeah. Um, a tiny a tiny side example. Um, one of my critiques of policing in the U.S. is that most police departments, many of them, have been through a training called Bulletproof Warrior which mm -hmm. is run by a guy named David Grossman, who wrote a book titled On Killing, which I used to quote happily because it was about the psychology of killing. And it turns mm -hmm. out that Bulletproof Warrior basically trains police that it's you or them. And the moment you feel threatened, you should just empty your clip into the person you're, who's threatening you. Mm -hmm. It is horrifying. And that is the, the training that we're putting police through in, as opposed to the Peel principles, which are the foundations of the London Metropolitan Police, which basically don't give them weapons and say, your job is to disarm the situation by neutralizing, just like talking the person down, whatever it might be, which is a tremendously human way to do things. But we've lost that. We're, we're, in, we're off in some other crazy place where we need better tools to, to take this apart.